It's a great privilege to be part of this global conversation and a considerable honour. Uh, all over the world, people are trying to figure out how to come to terms with the pandemic and what comes next. Like everybody else, we're in lockdown, in our case in London, uh, trying to persuade ourselves that we're going to get round to all those things that time previously didn't allow us to get round to and to do something productive and worthwhile. And of course, what we're really doing most of the time is contributing to the stock price of Netflix. But even so, we are trying to look ahead, as everybody is, to a time when we might get back to normal. The question really is, what type of normal do we want to get back to? And is it the normal that we've left behind us? I think it shouldn't be, and I'm sure I'm not alone in thinking that. There are all kinds of reasons for saying this, and I want to talk a little bit about education. This has been a huge shift for families, for children, and for educators all around the world. It's the first time in literally hundreds of years that the whole education systems have just been turned off effectively. The, the treadmill has stopped and children have been at home with their parents, with their relatives, whatever the situation is, uh, trying to come to terms with how to carry on learning in this new situation. Well, I think there are all kinds of lessons that we should learn from this as we look ahead to getting back to normal. But let me just say a word or two about the pandemic, because this is, I think, very relevant to the bigger issues that we, we are going to face. You know, whatever else we might say about the pandemic, I think we have to recognise that this is largely of our own making. What I mean by that is that uh, humanity, if I can speak of us collectively, has created all kinds of conditions which are, frankly, hostile to our best interests. You know, I've long felt that we're facing two major climate crises. There is a climate crisis which is enveloping all of us, and it was there before this pandemic hit us. The pandemic, frankly, is part of it, and it's still there, waiting to be dealt with. Uh, but there's also been a long-term crisis in our ways of life, in the uh, lack of fulfilment many people feel, in the tensions, the stresses, the anxieties. And all of this, I think, is related to our neglect of our relationship with the natural world with nature, with the other creatures we share this planet with and with the ecosystems that we depend upon. Now, look, there's a connection here in the way we've come to think about education. Let me put it this way. Most mass systems of education came into being you know, in the 18th century, and they're mostly based on the process of industrialism. Now, there's an interesting parallel here, which is that the Industrial Revolution changed everything, of course, in the way that human beings conduct our lives. You know, we often talk about the need to save the planet. I mean, I don't know if you do. I, I often talk about it anyway. But uh, many people do. We, people say, you know, we, we have to solve the climate crisis and save the planet. You know, honestly, I feel fairly relaxed about this. I think the planet's going to be fine. Uh, we may not make it, but the planet will be great. The Earth has been around, so far as we can tell, for four and a half billion years Human beings like us have been around for about 200,000 years. Now, I know that's a hard figure to visualise, but one way of thinking about it is this, that if you were to think of the whole history of the Earth as one year, a human beings showed up at less than a minute to midnight on the 31st of December. Now, the dinosaurs lasted, as far as we know, 30 million years. And we've managed in the space of just a few hundred to create circumstances which are now inimical, very often, to our own flourishing. And I think I know why it is. A lot of people do know why it is. But let me just say why I think it's important to see the parallels with education, how we have created our human communities. The Industrial Revolution brought about massive changes in manufacturing, in technology, and created the modern world that we now live in. It, as part of that, the Industrial Revolution ran through agriculture. And it did that in three ways. One was mechanisation. So for the first time, it was possible to plough huge tracts of lands with uh, mechanical diggers and harrows and ploughs and create massive monocultures, you know, bananas as far as I could see. I mean, not in England, as it turns out, but, uh, you know, but cabbages as far as you could see. Great monocultures. So there was a great hit on diversity at that point. Secondly, there was a big emphasis on fertilisers, chemical fertilisers. And the reason is, that in industrial farming processes, the emphasis is on increasing output, you know, more of everything, bigger everything. And fertilisers managed to achieve that with fantastic success, by the way. Uh, the, re the result of that is that we have huge surpluses very often, unevenly distributed. It's one of the great ironies of life on Earth, that we have huge mountains of food that we're throwing away 
while whole tracts of the population are living in, in poverty and starving. But that's an issue also that we don't want to get back to normal about, I'm sure. But there's a third element to this, which was, having created these huge monocultures, the uh, plants that were there often lacked the natural protection that comes from diversity in natural systems. And so it was important, or necessary anyway, to protect them with chemical pesticides. And the result of that was the devastation of insect life, among others, and all the, all the life forms that depend, up, depend upon it in the food chain, you know, birds and so on, small animals. It gave rise to Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Now, the thing is, all this has been, from one point of view, a vast success. But it's also been a catastrophic failure because these systems are simply not sustainable. And let me tell you one reason why that's true. Industrial farming has been focused primarily on output, on yield, you know, more, bigger, better. And the focus, if you look at, uh, at crops, has been on the plant. Now, that may seem obvious in a way, but the result of it has been that soils have been eroded and degraded all around the planet. You know, we all depend on this very thin smear of soil that only covers part of the earth for everything that grows. And those have been pretty badly degraded. We've seen them being washed away with polluted water cycles, oceans. Well, you know the story. Um, the thing is that there are alternatives to these industrial systems. They're variously called organic and sustainable farming, but there's a big difference. In these systems, there's an emphasis on diversity, on crops being grown uh, in close proximity, so they create their own natural protectedness. They create conditions where insects and the wildlife depends upon them flourishes. They have natural hedgerows and so on, natural crop rotation cycles. But the big difference is that in sustainable versions of farming, the emphasis is not on the plant, it's on the soil. Sustainable farmers know we have to get the soil right. And if we get the soil right through natural processes of, of cultivation, then life will flourish indefinitely. And this is not the case with the chemicals which have been laced into the soils, which are killing all of the nutrients on which life ultimately depends. So we've had great short-term success with these industrial systems, but they've also led to a catastrophic price. And we see that in the extent and the spread of the climate crisis currently. Now, the reason I'm saying all of this is that we have to make a settlement with the earth and we'll only make that settlement if we think differently about our relationship with it. And not only with plants, but also with the animals that we've come to depend upon. We've pretty much eradicated huge numbers of species in our dependence now on diets which are primarily based on four animals, you know, sheep and uh, cows and pigs and, and, and poultry. Now, these actually outnumber us by huge amounts. All of these things creep up on us naturally, don't they? they they're they unnoticed. It's that boiling frog syndrome where we don't realise that these systems have overtaken us. But the consequence is that we have created systems which are unnatural and are short-term and not sustainable. Incidentally, the consequence as well is that we've created uh, sources of, of processed foods which are wreaking havoc on our own health. Now, you know a lot of this. But what I'm really saying is that we've replicated these same mistakes in our social systems, and particularly in education. Our education systems are based on output, on yield. We put our children through these systems year after year, age group by age group, and the emphasis has been on output, on test data, on scores, on graduation rates, on everybody going to college and getting a degree. And this is as pointless and unsustainable in its own way as agricultural systems are based on industrial principles. Human beings are like the rest of life on Earth. We flourish under certain conditions and we wither in other, in other circumstances. The other parallel is this, that when I say that agricultural systems, the sustainable systems are based on cultivating the soil, this is also true of our communities, in our cities, in our neighbourhoods, in our schools, that people flourish when the culture is right. Great teachers, great principals, great school systems understand that you don't make a successful education system based on driving people through pointless systems of tests and output and data-driven hurdles. That the way you get people to flourish is by recognising their individuality, the great diversity and depth of people's talents. For our, our children from every age are full of boundless possibilities. And you do that by creating 
a mixed culture in schools, one that values the sciences, the arts, technology, that, that values individual talent, the driving force of individual passions. In other words, successful schools don't focus on output, they focus on culture in the same way that sustainable farmers focus on the soil. If you get the culture right, everything else takes care of itself. And that really means a culture of compassion, of collaboration, of empathy, and of the valuing of individuals and the necessity of our social lives thriving through our joint participation. By the way, if we found out anything in this pandemic, it's how fundamentally we rely on these sorts of processes when the chips are down. The great suffering that's been afflicting many people during the pandemic is isolation. We've had to isolate ourselves. It's been vitally important to stop the spread of the virus. But we all know what terrible prices people have been paying in terms of their mental health by being isolated. And how are they dealing with it? By turning to creative work, to painting, to music, to collaboration, through joining together through joint projects like this uh, process today, Unite. We're here all today because we need to connect. We need to see each other in our own settings and we need to see each other through the, the phase and lens of our common humanity. So I believe profoundly that getting back to normal won't work. We've pressed pause on many of our social systems. It's time to press reset on them as well. There is a chance to do that. You know, lots of people have been spending time at home learning with their children, children with their peer groups. I believe the most successful, and we've spoken to a lot of parents, the most successful examples are where parents haven't felt the need to replicate school. There's a big difference between learning, education, and school. Learning is the most natural process in the world. We love to learn. We're deeply curious creatures, highly creative, uh, deeply compassionate, and highly collaborative. People love to learn from a very early age. Not everybody gets on with education. A lot of people don't like school. And I say that not in criticism of teachers. I've spent my life working with teachers and I have the deepest respect for teachers. I am a teacher, frankly, so I'm not here to criticise them in any way, whatever, but to support them. The problem is not teachers, it's not kids, it's not families, it's how we do school. We've come to think of schools as particular types of places that resemble in many key respects the, uh, the algorithms and principles of standardisation and of factory life. And there isn't any reason for schools to be that way. We can reinvent school, we can revitalise learning, and we can reignite the creative compassion of our communities if we think differently when we try to go back to normal. Well, look, how do we do all of that? Well, I think there's a big parallel here between what needs to happen in education and in the environmental movement. It's based on the same principles, and it's, it's achieving or aiming to achieve the same ends. We need to work together, we need to keep up the collaboration that's being witnessed today through UNITE, and we need to see that real social change comes from the ground up through people cultivating the grassroots. You know, it's a mistake to believe that we just need to wait till some enlightened politician comes along and shows us the way. You know, with luck and a following in that happens from time to time, or often than not, frankly, it doesn't. Uh, the real power is with the people. And connecting people, as we're doing today through UNITE, is the key to this. Getting people to share ideas, to collaborate, to work together, to see future possibilities and to bring them about through joint projects and through the joint support that comes from, from compassionate collaboration. There are two projects I'd just like to quickly mention, which I think will have a big role to play as we go back to our new normal. One of them is a platform for educators, which I and others are putting together, called Boundless, uh, you can go to that website, you'll find out more about it, but it's designed there to help people to share ideas, work together, and to revivify learning in their own communities. And I hope you'll become part of that movement. And the other is a new learning platform called Hello Genius, which is designed to create a safe learning environment online for our children in a way that allows them to follow their personal interests, to learn about the world around them, and to discover their own passions in a way that also engages the support and understanding of their parents. Both of these platforms, I think, will have an important contribution to make to this new normal that we want to create ahead of us. You know, we are deeply creative creatures. Although we are like the rest of life on Earth, there's one key respect in which we are different. The difference is that we have boundless capacities for innovation, imagination and creativity. You know, we don't live in the world as other creatures do. We should live in the world as they do more than we have done. But there is this difference that we've always 
created ideas about the world. We have languages through which we express our feelings and communicate with each other about the world. We create works of art, scientific theories, philosophies. We create, in a word, cultures. And our cultures define us in more ways often than we can really see uh, openly or suspect. The world is full of diverse cultures, diverse ways of seeing. That is true, but we also have common interests. We have a common set of of fortunes to confront. We are a single species with other species on one planet. And as we get back to normal, we need to reimagine what that could look like and to learn the lessons of this lockdown, to learn the lessons of the pandemic, to see beyond them and to create a new sort of world and a new kind of normal. There is an opportunity. It takes bravery and imagination, and we have plenty of that in store. Thank you.